Hi, everyone, and welcome to Greenbelt at Home, uh, Animal Ambassadors Program for today. Uh, we're going to be joining Chris Ricker, our environmental educator, in a moment. Um, we're just going to wait until a couple of people pop on. Um, if it's your first time joining us, thank you for uh, coming in and, and being part of our program. If you want to know anything about our virtual programs, please go to our website at sigreenbelt.org, or you can always follow us here on our Greenbelt Conservancy Facebook page or our Greenbelt Environmental Education Facebook page. So uh, let's give it a few minutes and then we're going to join Chris. And we have one viewer with us right now. Say hi to Flower. All right, so in about another few seconds, we will join Christopher Ricker, our environmental educator here at our Animal Ambassadors program. Just giving you a little preview of the rest of our folks that we have uh, living here. You might have met some of them on our other programs. So I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Ricker. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Karen, for introducing me. Again, welcome to our Greenbelt at Home virtual program, Animal Ambassadors. So each month we get to meet and learn about some of the animals that we keep up here at High Rock Park that act as ambassadors for their species, so for their kind. Each year they teach hundreds of school kids and patrons the important lessons of ecology, natural history, but most importantly, conservation. Because unless we keep areas like the Greenbelt and High Rock Park protected, uh, these animal ambassadors, their, their kind and their families, which call these parts home, can lose those important vital habitats. And so today, we are going to meet Hopper. And Hopper is an American bullfrog. So American bullfrogs are our largest frog species here in North America. And I'm just going to gently lift this top off. And hopefully Hopper doesn't shoot out, but Karen can get a nice little image from up above. And again, Hopper is an American bullfrog. This is not his home. This is just a container we're keeping him in so you guys at home can get a little bit better view of him. And bullfrogs are one of our native frog species. And like I said, they're the largest species in North America and certainly the largest species we have here in Staten Island. Now... Bullfrogs, which you can see from here, right? So over here, bullfrogs, again, are slimy and swiggly and squirrely. And that's because they are amphibians. So bullfrogs, like other amphibians, whether we're talking about so toads, frogs, or salamanders, have skin that they're able to actually pass gases through. So they're able to breathe through that skin. And that's why... Frogs and other amphibians are really great indicator species. They tell us the health of an ecosystem, whether through biodiversity or just by their presence. Because they often live in wetlands, uh, they can tell if there's any sort of toxins or pollution. So the first ones that are affected by that because they are breathing through that skin. Now, bullfrogs are really unique because when it comes to their reproduction, right? So for the most part, frogs, the males will call to alert females that they are ready to breed. But there are actually female bullfrogs that will call as well. And when female bullfrogs begin to call, that really excites the males to get ready for the breeding season. And bullfrogs being large frogs are super territorial. So you'll see male bullfrogs on the banks of ponds, lakes, marshes, and that's where they'll actually call. They'll find a little spot, a little territory to call from, and they'll protect that territory. So if another 
male moves into that territory, they'll defend it. And usually they do that by puffing out their throat and male bullfrogs will have a really yellow coloration in there. And during the breeding season, they'll bleep, bleep, chug a rum, chug a rum, right? They'll send out that throat. And if another male comes, they'll actually face off and they'll point their faces to the sky and they'll try to intimidate them with that big chug a rum sound. And then if that doesn't work, the males will try to bite each other's heads and try to send the other male out of their territory so that they can attract females to that spot. Now, bullfrogs are known as true frogs. And when we say true frogs, we mean frogs that live in the water. So they spend most of their life in an aquatic environment. And you can see those big webbed feet and those really long legs. Now, those help to propel them through the water, but also allows them to jump pretty far. A male bullfrog, which is the larger of the bullfrog sexes, can leap quite almost a meter or two when they need to, to get away from predators or just to take a splash in the water. And you can see on their feet too, we also know it's a male because you can see these little additional pads on their thumbs. And that's a sign that it is a male. I don't know if you can capture yep. that on the camera, right? And that'll be used during breeding so that they can actually attach better to a female bullfrog. Now, female bullfrogs are the ones who decides when courtship begins. So a female bullfrog will move into a male's territory when she's ready to reproduce during the breeding season. And otherwise, she'll just stay far away from the males. And so it's not until she moves into that territory that the male will begin his courtship. We can also look at this large round part right over here. And that large membrane is also telling us that it's a male. So this is their ear. And so when you have a female bullfrog, the eye and the ear will be kind of close, uh, similar in size, where the membrane of these males will be much larger. He's pretty calm. And you can see that his eyes and nostrils are set pretty high up on his face. And that's part of their adaptation. So just like an alligator or a crocodile, a bullfrog will sit really low in the water where just its eyes and noses protrude. And then when it sees something it wants to eat, whether it's another frog, whether it's a rodent, uh, bullfrogs have been known to eat ducklings and small birds as well. They'll use those big chompers, and they'll open that mouth wide and grab it and swallow it whole just like a snake. So I'm just going to place him down. So he probably won't make his sound for us today because it is winter. Um, but I have something known as an identifier. And we utilize these little devices when we're doing our frog watch programs. So when we're teaching individuals how to monitor frog populations through their call, we use our identifier. And so for all of you at home, I'm going to play the bullfrog's call, just so you all can hear what it sounds like. So generally starting in May, male bullfrogs, as the season gets warmer, will begin to call like that. And usually their season will... The breeding season will last from about May into June and then somewhat into July, though you can hear some individual males calling at different times as well. And bullfrog tadpoles are pretty cool too because some bullfrog tadpoles can get as large as six inches. And a lot of times they will overwinter before they go through what's known as their metamorphosis. So what do I mean by metamorphosis? Well, that is the life cycle of different organisms or different living creatures. And so down here, I have a couple figurines to show us what the life cycle of a bullfrog is. Again, so all amphibians are going to start as eggs. So these egg masses will be found in still water. So not running water like streams, but things like swamps and ponds and lakes where the water has no current. This is where the egg masses are going to exist. Once they're fertilized by a male and they hatch, you're going to have a small tadpole. And that tadpole is going to be pretty much 
completely aquatic. They're going to have gills, and they're also going to process oxygen through their skin from their aquatic environment. From there, uh, the tadpole is going to begin to grow legs. Generally, they're going to grow their rear and their front ones, and then they're going to change into something kind of like this, where they have legs, they still have their tail, but they're starting to get some frog, um, some frogness going on. And so I actually had these two mixed up, so it's a little bit more like that, where they're super tadpole-y. And then they're going to turn into a little bit of what's starting to become a froglet. They're going to lose that tail because they're going to be spending more time on the land as well as in the water. And then eventually they're going to become a full functioning adult frog. So again, this process is known as metamorphosis, which the majority of amphibians in the world go through. There are some salamanders that do not go through metamorphosis, um, but bullfrogs definitely do. So we have Mr. Hopper here because he was uh, brought to us by folks from the Staten Island Zoo because he couldn't be released back into the wild because of the bacteria that he is holding with his, his skin that can affect other frog populations. And globally, we're having a lot of challenges with our frog and amphibian populations. So a third of all amphibians around the world are currently in decline. And some of that is due to habitat destruction. Some of it's due to the introduction of parasites or invasive species. Climate change definitely has a large, um, plays a large role in this because as we're having longer drought seasons, longer wet seasons, that is affecting frog and amphibian populations. So you want to get really close to the camera to see all of you. So um, bullfrogs in particular have been introduced around the world, uh, partially because of the, the pet trade, but also because of their part in uh, dietary uh, people's interest in eating them, right? So they've been introduced to places like uh, China, Japan, in the Philippines, uh, in different parts of Europe. So just like we have a lot of invasive species here in the United States that have come from other places, these bullfrogs have been around, brought around the world, introduced. Sometimes they can introduce parasites. Uh, sometimes they can become invasive or noxious and outcompete native amphibians. There's even some parts in the United States where they originally weren't found within their range and have now impacted negatively um, different native North American species within those regions. But our buddy here is kept as an ambassador to teach individuals that it's super important to protect our wetlands, to protect habitat, because even though bullfrogs here on Staten Island are pretty plentiful right now, um, if we continue to pollute our environments, if we continue to destroy habitat, we could lose even some of these species. So Mr. Hopper reminds individuals on a daily basis how important it is to protect our natural areas. Currently, I believe we have five frog species found on Staten Island. While we look back in the records that William T. Davis, the uh, naturalist and historian of Staten Island, uh, had something like 11 species of frogs and toads during his time period. So, quick question, Chris. I've noticed that he has, he's almost like blinking his eye, but it looks like a membrane. Mm -hmm. um, I know we, I think everyone could see that pretty well. Um, right, so what is that? Right. So as we're talking about him being a semi-aquatic animal, when he goes underneath the water, whether to look for prey, whether to escape predators, he wants to be able to see underwater. So all of you, if you go into a pool or a lake, you might put on goggles. So that lens is acting like another goggle over his eyes. So when he is underwater, he can see. Similar membrane to uh, crocodilians. So alligators and crocodiles both have that membrane as well. So when he closes his eye, he opens it. You can see that membrane just move down. 
Very cool. So that's all we have today for Mr. Hopper. We want to make sure we get him back into his aquatic environment um, with the least amount of stress. Again, this is a captive animal, so he's a little more used to us than a wild frog would. Again, we're really excited to be able to share our animal ambassadors with you, even during this time where we're doing a lot of remote programs, and hopefully in the future when we're able to open up in programs, in-person programs, you can all come visit Mr. Hopper and our other ambassador animals here at High Rock Park. Again, if you're interested in learning more about the Greenbelt and our virtual programs, you can visit our website at sigreenbelt.org. We also have our YouTube channel, which is the Staten Island Greenbelt, as well as Greenbelt Environmental Education Facebook page, Greenbelt Conservancy Facebook page, and Instagram. So you can always catch the latest news of what's going on in our park. Again, on behalf of Hopper and all of our other animal ambassadors, we want to thank you for supporting the Greenbelt and our education. Have a great day.